So uh, if you remember the club three or four years ago, uh, I did a presentation at that time uh, addressing this particular uh, end table. And what I got into at that time was mostly material selection, uh, layout, and milling. So uh, three years ago, as far as I could get in about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour presentation was, was through, like I said, material selection kinds of uh, notions, layout and milling. Uh, so what I'm gonna try to do tonight is, is just really highlight uh, a catch up on, on, on the bullet points from that, that presentation and then pick it up from there and get more into uh, things like marking and running uh, mortises, drawer joinery, uh, glue up strategies, uh, breadboard ends, uh, and, and, and see, as far, see how far we can get into some of the green and green specific details. So I'm kind of wanting it to be more generic, uh, joinery, glue up processing issues um, that would apply to any style. Um, but obviously I have a lot of familiarity with a lot of unique details that are seen commonly in green and green uh, style furniture. So um, if there's a jig for it, I've got it. <laughs> and so I'm happy to share that. So that's where, that's where we're gonna go. Um, and, and I'll first off apologize because there, I, was, I was wanting to send out um, of the original document that I used as my cheat sheet for the first presentation, send it out to everybody along with the Zoom invitation for this meeting. So you had that to kind of walk along with and have as a refresher um, with all of the details and specifics. Um, and I, I, I didn't realize that Al Ashley was gonna be leaving town and, and I missed the window to get that document to him before he took off. And he's the only one that has the ability uh, to do a broadcast distribution to the whole membership. So I will have him send that this out to you um, in the next few days when he gets back in town. And then you'll have this document with, with more of the specifics. Um, so that being said, um, the basis uh, that I started from was, was that we typically need to have a scale drawing to start whether this is a CAD drawing that you've done uh, or uh, drawings from a magazine article that has all the cut list and all the method, all the processes and stuff listed, um, a hand-drawn uh, scale drawing, um, whatever, whatever method you have for getting a scale drawing, which then leads you to having a cut list, you then have a list of the materials you need for the project. So, the next thing you need to do is, 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 so what lumber do I need for this project? And the first question becomes, are there any of the parts that need to be quarter sawn or riff sawn or plane sawn um, other than, and then there are criteria that have to do with uh, stability of the wood or appearance of the wood for that matter. So uh, in terms of, Again, I'm trying. This is, I'm gonna kind of be skimming here, but um, this is a this is a quarter sawn board, and you can see I penciled in so it's easier to tell. That's that. Those are the growth rims. So that is truly a quarter sawn board, uh, and this is an ideal board to have if you're going to be gluing up multiple boards for a wide tabletop or desktop or anything like that, where you have a wide expanse that needs to be glued up and needs to stay stable. Uh, this is extremely stable because the growth rings run the short direction. Expansion and contraction in a board happens mostly, almost exclusively along the growth rings. That, and that's tangential. Radially, which means across, across those growth rings, the expansion and contraction is about 50% of what it is along the growth rings. So it's far less significant. That's what makes this border an extremely stable one. Uh, the majority of the expansion is in this short distance. And this is the table top. So if it expands and gets a little thicker or a little thinner, that's usually a freestanding piece of the, of the, of the uh, furniture piece. And so it's not impacted. Joinery is not impacted. 
by that expansion and contraction. So one reason you would want to have quarter sawn lumber for your top. Here, it's close enough to the camera. This is one board. You can see the growth rings, looks like a smiley face there. So this was ripped into three pieces. And if you look closely at the two outside ones, the growth rings run at about a 45 degree angle from corner to corner. On the middle one, they're almost flat. So the two outside ones are what's called rift sawn. They're the next most stable cut next to quarter sawn. The flat sawn, the middle one is flat sawn. That is the least stable. Um, and a common application for using the rift sawn pieces is for a chair leg. And if you look at the way the grain looks on the sides, one of the reasons is when it's rift sawn, the grain on all four sides looks extremely similar. So if you're gonna have two faces on a leg, let's say it's the left front leg, that means that the front of the leg is very visible and the side of the leg is very visible. And, and the more similar these look, the, the smoother the design, the smoother the feel of the piece. If you, if you did the same thing, if you use this flat sawn piece where the grain goes straight across, you could say, oh, there, the grain looks just very straight and, and clean also. But when you go to the face of it, that's the flat sawn part, plain sawn part. That doesn't look anything at all like that face. So if two faces of your furniture element, furniture piece are gonna be visible, you would not want to use this board for that application. So that becomes one of the criteria when you go looking at the, at, at the lumber yard for boards, is to kind of have your little cheat sheet as to what, what type of cut are you looking for when you look at the end grain for different parts. Um, I also look at, at um, depending on the piece, sometimes I, I need to have several parts of the furniture piece are very closely aligned and very, they're in the same face. I want them, it'd be ideal to have them come out of the same board. I wanna make a note of, I need to have the aprons and the stretchers come from the same board. This is, these are just little reminders for you to take with you to the lumber yard when you go picking boards. Um, and so that's another one. I, I, and also another one, if, if you have, a, let's say the furniture piece has a, a curved, uh, curved edge on, on the aprons. Uh, make a note of that when you go to lumber yard and look, if you can find a piece of board that has the grain that actually flows very similar to the, that arch that you're gonna have cut on the bottom edge of uh, a piece, it'll enhance the furniture piece tremendously. It'll just make a huge, huge difference because it, it, it looks, it makes it appear as though the, 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 the piece grew out of the tree. I mean, it was just meant to be. Um, Another issue you need to deal with when you're going to the lumber yard to get your materials is thickness of boards. Um, and that's another thing for, for that cut list to come in handy. If you need to end up with piece parts that are seven eighths of an inch thick, let's say, you could say, okay, well, I'll buy four quarter boards. Those are one inch thick. Well, they're one inch thick when they're rough sawn. Um, you need to have seven eighths of an inch thick after it's been flattened on the joiner, planed to get parallel and smooth surfaces, and then final thickness after you've allowed for some potential expansion, contraction, um, twisting, bowing, you know, things happen. Um, so I, I, I never cut it that close. If you're, if you're buying rough sawn boards, yes, they should have been one, one inch thick if it's four quarter when it was milled. It probably has dried since it was milled. So it's probably a little less than that. By the time you, again, so by the time you joint one edge, one face flat, plane the other one flat, you're likely to be really close to seven eighths of an inch 
and you haven't necessarily dealt with any adjusting that's going to happen after you stickered and stacked the material to let it acclimate. So I always I always bump up an extra quarter if I'm any, coming anywhere close to say four quarter. I need, if I need seven eighths or seven or fifteen sixteenths, I always go to five quarter material, um, and and likewise on up up the ladder. But uh, don't cut yourself too too short. Bottom line. Um, Another thing that I, I have learned over time, and it was just, it's been the hard way because I, I'll oftentimes go and I'll, I'll find a, this 12 inch wide board or a 14 inch wide board and I need a bunch of narrow pieces. And I, keep, I, and I think, well, I can just rip, I can get six of them out of that, that width. Um, I tell you what, that, that has burned me so many times because oh, in so many cases, a wide board still has a lot of, tension in it from when the tree was growing. And every time you rip a board, it releases some amount of that tension. And across the width of a 12 or 14 inch board, if you cut that into six two inch wide boards, um, what I've experienced at least has been, I end up with six bananas basically. Uh, they just, they, the, the, the tension that gets released, I end up then in order to get them straight, I end up with maybe an inch and a quarter left, and what I needed was inch and a half. So uh, my my answer to that has been to to generally have my list of I need twelve. Or if I need six two inch boards, I'll look for four and a half or five inch wide boards where I can comfortably get two out of a board, and it still allows a little extra room for release of tension and, and uh, uh, warping and twisting, crooking, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and and I, I've been, yes, you're buying, you're buying 10 or 15 or 20% more material than you need because you've got that waste being cut off. But you, what you save in the headache of re-milling and ending up with stuff that you can't use for anything, uh, it's, it's been well worth it to me. And that's just, again, just one of my, one of my things. Um, and so what I, what I generally bottom line end up with, if I'm looking to, to calculate how many board feet I need to buy, uh, just to have like a rough number in my head, I generally, I, buy, I usually buy a rough mill number, um, which is also called hit and miss. So it's been skip plane. Uh, it's not completely clean. It's still got a lot of fuzz on the surface, so you can't see all of the grain. You can't see all of the imperfections, but you get a pretty good feel for grain direction and, and uh, whether there are pitch pockets in there or anything like that or knots, stress fractures like that usually will show up in that point. But um, I, I generally end up at, at about 30 to 50% uh, waste factor uh, when I buy my lumber. Um, layout, uh, again, I'm just gonna kind of highlight here. Um, this, this may seem real stupid simple, but um, I, I like these old style flat carpenter's pencils. Um, they're very broad, they're very heavy, lead. Um, they're not sharp and pointy, um, sharp and pointy on any kind of wood that has any kind of give to it all ends up leaving not only the lead, but a scratch in the wood that matches where the lead is. Um, and it can cause uh, sanding issues down the line. Um, I, I like the fact that this is a, a broad piece of lead and it leaves a, a significant, a very visible marking on it. So it's easy to read my markings and it, and it does not dent the wood. So I don't have to sand it out. It's easy to, I mean, it's a light sanding. Uh, so anyway, I'll use those. There's also another one uh, It's out on the market. It's actually pretty good. It's called a pica dry. Um, I don't know if I can get that close enough, but they're, uh, it's, it's a, again, it's a probably oh, a good full eighth inch thick lead. Maybe you can see it there more. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty heavy, heavy lead pencil. You can buy, you can buy colored ink, colored ink for these. So if, if red stands out better for you, or if you're on a light colored wood, you don't need a real black 
color. You can you can uh, get different colors there that are more visible. Um, what I try to do in, is is I I'm, I'll always mark the faces of my my piece parts as I go, and I'll mark the, the, the face and I'll mark the top edge. And I mark them in a such a way that it's big enough for me to read easily from while I'm shuffling boards. And, and it always is marked this way so that I know if this is the right side, then this is the front, and this is the back, and this is the top because that R is standing upright. If, I'm, if I joint this face off and I forget to, to to, to note that that's, that's the face. I can also tell with that mark the same way with the R up, I know it's the top and I know that'll be the face. I know this will be the front and that'll be the back. Um, if, I, if I have the board, like if I'm marking my boards and I have it this way and, I'm, and I mark it as the right side, I have no idea which, which edge goes up and which one is the front or the back, or the, you know, you know what I mean? So try to be consistent on how you mark your pieces. And in the long run, it'll save you a ton of time. Uh, there are times also um, when I'm, I'm needing parts that need, to, let's say I want a straight grain. Um, but all the boards that are available um, have, have a, you see the angle, the angle of the grain, it's, it's, it's sloping this side. Um, that's not necessarily the end of the world. Um, if, if that's the, the piece I need, there, see that one. I can orient the grain to make it look as though when, when I get it cut, it's going to look like a straight grain and not have that angle in it. Uh, and, and again, it's, it's one of those, it's a fine line between well-designed piece and, a, and a, good, a good, just a good piece. Um, and I've seen a lot of pieces of furniture where you see that angled grain and you think, God, if that was a wider board, it would have been so simple to make that straight and it would look, it would look perfectly balanced. Um, it's not a big thing to do that. It's very simple. So you can mark, mark out a window like that. Uh, Cut it to length, take it to the bandsaw, and you can you can eyeball that first cut, joint that, and then rip parallel to it for the other edge, and you've got a piece that came out of what you would have thought was a perfectly straight grain piece of wood. Doesn't take a lot of time, doesn't take a lot of effort, special tool. Um, I also, I mean, I also try to, and I think we've talked about this in, in a lot of club meetings too, that, that you know, if you're going to have like, like on this, on this table where um, this, the sides and the drawer front and, and the other side, if you can get one long board uh, and then cut those pieces sequentially and put, and put them together, it has a much more cohesive design feel to it. It, it, it doesn't look like a factory made randomly selected pieces out of a pile that just get, got put on there that don't have any connection to each other. When you can match this, have, follow the grain around the piece and have it all flow together, obviously it, it says a lot to your attention to detail. Um, okay, quickly on uh, let's go to milling. Uh, I, I always, I always mill up spare parts. Um, I, you know, I feel fortunate that I rarely have to use them. Um, but, you know, when you get 80% of the way through the process and, and all the joinery done, and then something happens, and it does, uh, it's, it's awfully nice to have a, a spare part that's, that's been kept, kept up all the way along the line and is ready to, to drop in and substitute for uh, another piece that got damaged or you know, you spaced out between lunch and coming back out and you cut the mortise on the, on referenced off the wrong face or something simple, uh, those things just happen. So I always mill up a few spare parts, especially those that have uh, significant joinery in them. And I also, wherever there's any parts that involve joinery, I'll have a, a poplar 
um, which is inexpensive and, and very uh, good wood, um, or whatever other materials I've got around, I'll always mill up a couple extra spare parts um, for, for joinery portions so I can use those to get my setups dialed in for the joinery. Um, and, and you know that's, that's the place to, to do the adjusting, not on the real deal, that perfect piece of wood for that perfect part. Um, uh, I also will break down boards. Uh, if I've got a long, say I've got a 12 foot board, 10 foot board, whatever it might be, but in length, I might have three different pieces that are gonna come out of that. Um, it's really obvious, I think, if there's, if there's twist in that board, um, that, that you can lose a lot of wood if you leave it all in one piece to flatten one side and then plane the other side parallel with it. Uh, if it's a long board and it's got a twist in it, you're gonna lose a ton of wood um, as opposed to cutting it into pieces first to length. Um, here, sorry, this one. This is, can you see the gap down here? I can, I can get my fingers completely underneath there. This is a two by four, two by three. Um, and I've, there's a three quarter inch gap in the middle. There's that much bow to it. Um, so if I was to, to take this piece to the jointer and flatten, Take that bottom corner off there, all the way across to get the bottom corner on the other end, to get that one side flat and then flip it and then take all that material off the top. I would be left with, after inch and a half thick starting point, I would have less than three quarters of an inch that would be flat usable wood in the middle of that. And if what I'm needing is, and you can see that's the march here, if I'm needing actually three pieces the same length, I can't, and I needed to have them an inch thick, I can't get them out of that. On the other hand, if I make, if I cut it to length first, close enough. Can you see the pencil marks there? Look how little is lost in getting that bow out of it. Very, very little because it, it's, the piece has been shortened. Um, so I'm, it's just always, always beneficial to break things down to slightly over length early in the process. My opinion, again, my experience has been, if I do that, if I break them down to just slightly over um, final length early in the process, I have fewer issues when I end up with something getting just either getting close to doing just barely thin, thick enough or usually it goes the other way and it's not thick enough anymore. I have to mill another piece. Um, so let's see. I generally, uh, let's talk about here again, bear with me. Okay, here's, here's, a, here's a board that has twist. Can you, can you see the gap down here? When I push on the back corner on the right here, there's that big gap. And then it closes up. So there's a huge twist here. Um, when, when I go to joint, to joint the first face, what I go to is about 60 or 70% completely flattened. Now you see on, on, I'm not sure which side you, to you, if it's a mirror image, but you can obviously see the pencil marks there that did not get plain. In running through, so this is this is one where I probably have flattened about seventy percent of this board. Uh, that's usually when I would say that is flat enough. That face now is stable. So now I can take this over to the planer and and surface the opposite face, and I'll take that face to about the same sixty or seventy percent like this, and at that point. I start flipping it on each pass. So I'm taking an equal amount off each fix until I get down to my final thickness that I need to get to. By doing that, I, I, I'm far more efficient at taking off an equal amount from the top and the bottom 
which is important because if you think about how a board dries, it, it's losing moisture and that's by evaporation. The surface of this board is what's losing the water. The very center of it is holding on to water. So if I joint this surface, it's gonna, it's gonna expose the more wet surface below. And if I, what I've seen an awful lot of people do, they'll joint one side flat, then they go to the planer and just keep and start running it through that same side up all the time until they get down to the thickness. So they might take off a 16th of an inch on the joiner, and then they take off a quarter of an inch on the planer, all off of one side. What that does is the planer surface side is deeper into the, so, towards the center of the wood. So it's wetter than a 16th inch deep from the opposite side. So this board still has a really good chance of developing a bow, okay? So again, I, I get one surface flat, get the next surface flat, and then always flip on each pass. So you take equal, equal amounts off, and you'll end up with far fewer redos, put it that way. And I, I generally, my, my standard is pretty much, uh, I'll leave about three thirty seconds of an inch uh, in extra thickness at, in this, at this first milling stage. Um, and then I'll sticker and stack my parts. Uh, and of course this, this is depending on how much time you have and space and all that kind of thing. If you're, but the, the, in, the, in the best scenario, I'll leave like three thirty seconds of an inch in extra meat on that. I'll sticker and stack the parts for a week or two. I come back down and I'll joint again and plane the same way. Joint until I get 60 or 70% flat and then flip, get 60 or 70% and then flip, flip. And I'll take it to about a 1 32nd of an inch extra. That's about 30 thousandths. So I'll sticker and stack them again for another week or so. And, and in, in, in that, in both of those instances, I've had the opportunity to take out any twist or cup or warp. And by that time, and, and as long as I'm taking off equal amounts off top and bottom, there shouldn't be, there should be less and less of that happening. So that I should be en ending up with in the final milling stage where I've got 132nd left. I have a, a drum sander that I, I do for that final pass. And that's, so that ends up being two or three passes on each side with a drum sander and, and I'm spot on. I mean, I can get within a thousandth or two or three at the tops and it's, and it's flat. So uh, you, can, you can experiment on your own how close you need those tolerances to be, but that, that's what works for me. Um, and then, so when you're, yeah. At that, at, and at that point, once, once, you've, once I've gotten it down, my material's mill, milled down to, to the final thickness, um, it's important to try to stay on the project. Um, to, to get the joiner glued up. Um, you, even after you've gone through all those steps and gone slowly with it, uh, to minimize additional warping and cupping and, and bowing, um, anytime you let wood sit, and especially in a shop where it might be heated, it might be unheated, um, windows and doors might be open on a rainy day, it might be sunny and hot, uh, uh, those boards can still move. And, and so um, I, I try to plan it. If I, if I know I'm only gonna have short chunks of time to work, um, I'll, I'll use that, those periods of time for, for doing the steps of milling. But I wanna be at a point where when I get done with that, get down to that final thickness on my milling, I've, I've got a good chunk of time to where I can get in, rip things to, to width, get them to cut the length, get the joinery going, Get at least some primary glue ups going so things are stabilized in position locked in place uh, and not going to be subject to more time uh, exposed to temperature and humidity changes um, so that's that's kind of the recap um, from session one um, and i'm about halfway into here so i'm gonna i'm gonna 
plow through here. Um, I have, uh, and just, just, just so we can get it out there to start with. If I don't get through everything I want to get through today, um, we're going to do a, a live VST. Um, and uh, we would ask that if there are portions that I, that you felt like you skipped over or skimmed over, you want more detail on, let us know. We'll make sure we cover those in a VST. Um, and I am also uh, going to be working with Greg here for first part of next year. Um, we've talked a bit about already about doing some project classes, actual project build. And I think this is one that I would do uh, offer up as, as three or four guys in my shop um, build this table. Uh, there are actually probably three different styles here we could do. Um, and we would be, you would get all of the detail gone through in, in, in that kind of a scenario. So there's, there's gonna be more opportunity down the line. Um, okay, so um, in starting in with the mortising, um, first thing I always, always wanna do is, is I'll, I'll gather up my four legs, group them the way they're gonna be oriented with the left front, right front, left rear, right rear. I wanna, I wanna put a pencil mark on the faces that are gonna get a mortise. And this is just, this is self-defense is all it is. Uh, I, I wanna have a pencil mark where I'm, I'm going to be putting a mortise. And there's one for an apron up there and there's one for a stretcher down here. And then you turn and you've got another apron up here and another stretcher down here. Um, in the heat of the moment, these legs start looking alike and, and you, you can very easily put the wrong face up against your cutter and you've got a, you got a slot on, on a face that's showing and that's not good. So that's kind of step number one for me is, is, is put those heads up marks on there um, to prevent a major issue. Um, so the next step for me then is to mark the center line of these mortises, okay? Uh, the, the method for doing the mortises that I'm gonna show you right here right now is, is probably one of the most simple ones. It's something that, that doesn't involve anything special, big, big tools. It's, it's a shop, shop built jig that I'm sure you've all seen in all the woodworking magazines. Um, it's, it's, it's easy to build, it's reliable. Um, so it's, it's a great way to get started. There are some other benefits to some of the other methods, but this is good, this is really good. So, but what I'm, what I'm going to do with that is I'm going to be referencing off the center of the mortise. So I need to have marking on, on the faces where I put the pencil marks. I want to know where the center line is on there. So I'm one of those that I want, I want to keep it as simple and, and, and stupid simple as I can. So I'll identify where the center line needs to be relative to the top, cut a scrap piece as a story stick, but I can just put this flush up at the top put the pencil line across there and I'm there. And every one of them on every leg will be in exactly the same location. And I have, I'm here to tell you, I've used a tape measure, I've used a rule, and it, it's, it just doesn't work 100%. I mean, sometimes I get distracted and I'll, instead of an inch and a quarter, I'm an inch and an eighth. Um, you, can't, you can't mess up with this. So I make, I make a, a story stick to, lo to locate the, apron mortises, and then I make another one that references off the bottom, that then gives me the center line for the stretcher mortise, okay? So I can go around and mark, mark all four legs, all of those mortises. So then the next part of the process is actually running the mortise. And again, you'll, I'll, if you can see this, there's a mark on each of these where there's a center line on the slot. Can you see that? And I, and, I, and I drew the pencil line down. So it goes, it's in here. It goes on the inside edge too. So what I'm gonna be doing then is taking center line, lining up the center line on the jig with the center line marking that I've got on the leg. Can you see that? I hope you can see that. 
Okay, so when those are aligned, this goes right to my bench vise and it gets clamped in there. Okay, so, so now the, the workpiece is being held properly aligned to the slot. I'm using a plunge router with a spiral up cut bit and a template guide. So this one happens to be bigger than you know, it's supposed to be for this one, but you get the idea here. This lines up in the slot. You plunge down, you pull it forward, plunge down, pull it forward. You take it in about one eighth inch steps back and forth until you're down to the bottom. And you've got those mortises. I, I made this so I've got two mortises on the same jig. So I've got both the apron mortise and the stretcher mortise in the one jig. So that covers your legs. But what about the aprons? Okay. Uh, the, same, the same templates get used to mark the center line on the apron on this edge. And then also on the little narrow stretchers, the same one gets, gets used there. Uh, but now the problem is, This, this apron is much thinner than this leg. So when I put the, the template on this board, it's not centered on the board. I can line up the line. See that? Okay, so the line is lined up, but you can see I'm not on the center of the board. So the simple solution here is mill up a scrap piece, a shim. Okay, so the shim goes up against the fence and moves the apron out. So now it is it is centered on the apron and the center lines line up. So I can do different thicknesses of material with the same jig and the length of the mortise and width of it and depth of it will be the same on all of them because you haven't changed that. Um, questions on that or anything, or anything so far? Yeah, I, I have a question, George. Okay. So in showing us this mortising jig, is that the way you actually do those? Or do you use your multi-router or that? Or are you showing this process I, for those without I, a multi-router? I, I myself, since I have a multi-router, I use the multi-router typically for these. OK. Um, I, and and I, when I first started teaching classes, I started teaching with this method because this is uh, not everybody is in a position to say, I'm going to buy a $3,000 multi Um I, in the working with, with Daryl in his shop, I got to use his multi router. I got used to doing it. Um, I saw lots and lots of advantages, and I was building and I'm not a, lot, a lot of furniture where I could easily justify it because I can move quicker and be more consistent. Um, this, this way gives us just as equally as good a result. Yeah. And it there, seems it, to me. You know, when more you're, moving. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, it seems to me when you're building many of the same thing to, to build a jig like that, your measuring is done. You don't have to do it again, essentially, right. you know, and right. whereas like I would assume with the multi-router, I certainly know with the horizontal mortiser that I have, you know, you still yeah. do have to make the measurements and set up and this and that, whereas that kind of is already done once you have it, if you're yeah. going into production. Uh, I, I think I think where 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 the, the biggest issue comes in is, is depending on how much you use this, um, and, and how many are you going to build? Yeah. Because because you have to build this to pretty tight tolerances, which which is not extremely difficult to do. But the point is, this template collar needs to fit in there. It needs number one, it, the slot needs to be wide enough that this collar will get in there and just a hair more. 
I mean, so you have to be able to get in there and it has to move freely enough for you to be able to go back and forth as you step down and step down and step down and step down to find all that. Now, if you, and, and if, it's, if it's snug, you're going to be herky and jerky and, and it's going to end up, a router is going to tip or and you're not going to get a clean cut. Conversely, if you make it too loose, yeah. then, it, then it can rattle around in there side to side as you go down and you either end up with not a smooth edge on either side or you end up with best possible ability is if you know it's doing that, then on your final pass, you pull it to this side, run down here, you push it to the other side and come up there. You've made a wider mortise, but as long as you do the same thing with all of them, when you machine your tenon stock, to fit in there, you make sure it's wide enough to fit what you did. Got it. Yeah. So, so, it's, so it's, it's doable. It's just something you need to be aware of. So you pay attention to the results you're having. Uh, and you, over time, again, uh, this is MDF and you got metal rubbing against it. Uh, and I, the things you do is, is, what I'll do is I'll take thin CA glue and coat the surface of the inside here where the metal, is, where the brass is rubbing against it. That, that thin CA sucks into the MDF and, and makes it rock hard without swelling it, making it a lot larger. So, um, so there's, there's less chance for the metal in doing a bunch of back and forth, and less chance of it enlarging it and making it sloppy. Are you saying you do that CA glue um, right as you That's make the, the template, right at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. yeah. right off the get-go, before I start using it. Got it. And then, and then again, make sure that this guy slides smoothly in it. And yeah. I'll wax it periodically, okay. like every other table I do. You wax that surface so it's smooth, stays slick. Because if, if there's friction, if there's drag, that's what causes it to wear. You keep it smooth operating, then there's no drag, and it's, and it's less likely to create a too wide of a slot. Okay, good tip. And, and on a tool like a horizontal mortiser, there are linear ball bearings that that. that there is no wear on, so you you don't have anything coming out of adjustment. Yeah. There. Uh, again, so it's a, it's kind of a volume choice. Got this it. this works great. You can do you can build five thousand dollar chairs with this just fine. Yeah. Cool. And, and, uh, you can make you you probably could make probably four of these that would cover. In, in the length of the mortises. Um, the scenario involved with, I don't know, 60, 80% of the furniture you build. So it's a matter of just picking the right one for the job. And then you just, just need shims to yeah. adjust for difference between the thickness of the leg and the apron. And shim stock is just whatever you have laying around. Just machine that down until it hits the center and there you go. Excellent. So it's not expensive equipment or anything and it's and it's not exotic woodworking you know, those are simple things to do okay cool. okay yep okay so uh and then i guess probably just to kind of finish that that topic is, is milling tenant stock and, and what i'll i'll do is all uh grain is running this way so i'll i'll take a scrap of and i generally i make my tenant stock out of the same kind of wood that the furniture is being made out of so if i'm building Something out of sepili, I use sepili. I'm building something out of ash, I use ash. If I'm using maple, I use maple. It's, it's just the same kind of wood, the same pore structure, the expansion contraction is gonna be very, very similar or identical. It's, you know, it's part of the same wood. So um, it's, it's gonna accommodate it well. Um, so I, I, I just take some tennis stock, some scrap wood that I've got, um, wider, slightly wider than my longest, uh, mortise, mill it down, and uh, there are a lot of ways to go with this. But I, I mean, I, I joint and I go to the planer. I work with the planer again, get it down, flip and flip until I get close, and then I'll, uh, I'll either my helical head planer, um, I can at the smallest cut I can take is twenty thousandths of an inch, which is still a pretty good bite when you want to try and get this within a couple of thousandths. Uh, so I'll, I've got my old. 10 inch Ryobi lunchbox planer that I got 25, 30 years ago, uh, cause it has rubber feed rollers. 
Um, and I can just take that a, a thousandth at a time and I can dial in or I can take it to my drum sander and I can get this just exactly where it needs to be. Then you just take it to a router table and you put the radius on the two edges because the router is going to leave rounded ends on your mortises. Um, so I'll, I'll put rounded ends on my tenon stock uh, and, then, and then cut them to length based on the depth of the mortises that you did. Okay. So that kind of wraps up there. And then I'm going to run over to uh, uh, drawers. Drawers come later, but I wanted to, I wanted to run through it uh, now. So we make sure we get there. Um, and I need to move the camera real quick. So Okay, show you the drawer a little closer up. Um, finger joints on the front corners. Um, there's a stopped dado on the sides for wood runners. There's a dado for the back to drop in. That's gotta be, there you go. And there, obviously there's a dado for the uh, plywood bottom to go into. So a lot of piece, a lot of things need to be dealt with there. Um, and the finger joints, as in all green and green uh, furniture, the, the fingers are actually proud. See how they stick out about an eighth of an inch. The side fingers extend about an eighth of an inch beyond the front of the, of the drawer, okay? And these are still squared off. They haven't gone through the step of pillowing them, rounding over all those edges to soften them. But the way these are being done on here uh, is, is we're just working off centers. Um, we need to be extremely accurate in milling, uh, ripping the sides and the fronts with the same setting on your table saw. They need to be exactly the same. But we end up because how we end up locating these finger joints is going to be referencing the top and the bottom edge. We're not measuring. We're not anything else. It's just we're referencing off the top and the bottom edges. Okay, I'm going to show you what I mean there. So the first. The first step we're going to do is we're going to route these dados to create three fingers on the sides. Okay, so we just make a determination of how wide do we want this finger to be. These are going to be identical. And in this scenario, these are five eighths of an inch. This is three quarters of an inch. And being different gives them a very different look than if you make them the same. And I think if you've ever done finger joints where you've got, you know, 15 of them in a row and they're all the same, it, it, it's very effective, it's very strong. It's just not a very nice looking joint. Um, having, having a variation in width gives a, di a different stylizing to it. Um, so we made the determination of how wide they're gonna be. Uh, and where it's going to be located, it's going to be five eighths an inch in from the edge. We're just using a, a standard miter gauge here. You can do this in a router table with a spiral bit. You can do this uh, with a dado blade on the table saw, same way. But this is essentially, and I hope you can see that, but we're just making one pass through to cut that finger and we flip it. So we referenced off the top edge and now off the bottom edge. And we do the same thing on the other end. I'm sorry, we're not doing that on the other end. So, so we do that on this side and on the other side, you do that again. And again, you always have 
another another one that you're having as a spare. This is actually going to be for setup because we're going to do the same thing. We're going to run that one, flip it, and run the other one. And then what I've done, I've taken it to the bandsaw and I've shortened this middle finger. And that's because I want to now, when I cut, start working on the front that's going to lock into this, I want to fit between this, this, this point over here and this point over here. And this has, this has to be out of the way in order for me to do that. I'll show you what I mean. Here. Okay, um, let's see. See where those are going? So I'm fitting from this, this edge right here and this edge right here. I, I haven't cut this yet. So I'm gonna take, I'm gonna go to the same setup on the router table and I'm gonna knock a little bit of the corner off. This is five eighths of an inch here. And my bit is half an inch diameter. So I'm gonna just take about a quarter of an inch off here on this corner and a quarter of an inch off on that corner. Then I'm gonna go back and readjust the fence and try and get close to this five eighths. But I'll just, I'll just come close and then do the other one, test the fit. And then I'll make another small adjustment until I can get it to where I can get in like this. I'm gonna be stopped by that finger. But now that I've got the fit out here and the fit out here, then I go back with this same piece and I move the fence so that my router bit is gonna come right in the middle of this, right on the center line of this board. This is three quarters of an inch wide and my bit is half an inch wide. So if I put it right dead center, then I just move it slightly and I run it and flip it, adjust it again, run it and flip it and run it and flip it. And pretty soon that's gonna fit in and then all three fingers drop right into place. That makes sense? One other step I did not mention, uh, uh, which I should have. You notice there's a shoulder. There's a shoulder here. I'm trying to get that light color behind it. See that that provides um, a, a, a spot for the uh, that that shoulder provides the ability to get to get that joint together square. You can clamp that. And, and you know, in two directions, clamping down the side and across the front, and that it virtually guarantees a squared up joint when you just pull that closed. And it also the other design factor it gives you is if we left if we didn't put the shoulder, then the side would be full thickness. That means that this finger would be wider, chunkier looking, and from the aesthetic standpoint. This looks better to my eye with these fingers being narrower like this. All right. George, one quick question while you're doing that. The, yep. the, I, I, I didn't get, why do you cut down that center piece? I wasn't sure. If it was, get that. it was, it was so that, um, okay. When I made my first cuts on, this is the front. Yeah. Okay. Um, you have to visualize this not being cut out yet. This oh. is solid. The oh. whole thing is solid across here. Oh, so I'm okay. Knocking, I got gotcha. you. I'm knocking the corners down here equally, the two corners, until, until these two surfaces fit within these two surfaces. Got it. And well, this gets in my... Piece. That's an extra this, piece that you Yeah, that, 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 that's what, yeah, this, this is not a backup piece this is a this is a setup piece okay got it yeah yeah this is just a it's just, it's just an, another piece that i ripped at the same time as i ripped the other stock and in it, it well and it yeah it's, it's a it's a throwaway when you get done got it but um uh, you have to have a little bit of it knocked out of there otherwise you can't get that you can't get the pieces together enough to test the fit sure okay so it's not it's not magical you could cut it all the way off yeah for that man but if you leave that much, then you can still use it as your, your test when you go to fit after cutting out the center portion. Got it, okay. Yeah. And, and, and to cut the shoulder, just so you know where that fits in the sequence, after, after these two dados have been cut, 
the setting, the, the bit is at, at the, right, is the right height right there. All we do is, is adjust the fence. We'll open up, we'll open up the, the, the fence and, and set the bit back into the fence so that only about 3 16ths of an inch is sticking out beyond the fence. And then we turn the piece that way and run it past there. And that cuts that 3 16ths shoulder on there. And it lines up at the same depth of cut because the router bit never was changed. Got it. And do you, when you personally do this, you're showing us on the router, but you could also accomplish this on the table saw. Well, how do you personally do it? Do you do router or table saw? I, I do it on the multi-router again. Oh, okay. Uh, I, have, I, will, I will just say this. I have done it in all three methods. And, and honestly, for me, the last choice is the table saw because I have, I get cleaner cuts with a router bit, with a spiral cutting router bit, um, whether it's fixed in, in a, a router table or if it's in a horizontal mortise. Um, there, um, there's still, there's a much more potential for tear out with a table saw. Okay. Back of help a lot, you know, really sharp, really clean blades help, of course, and the angle of, the angle of address. Um, it's just, it's a very, it's a highly visible joint. And if it's not a clean tight fit, it really stands out. And I, I just have, um, the process with a dado stack on a table saw is virtually identical to the process on the router table and a spiral cutting up cutting router bit always gives me a cleaner cut and, it, and it's no different process. So that's, that's my, that's my default. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, do I, do you want me to go over doing like the, uh, the stop dados? These are, these are kind of standard stuff. I'll drop them down on the, on the router table. It's, uh, it needs to stop up at the front and it's open on the back end. You have to be sure you reference off the same edge and, and I prefer to do it off the top edge. So top edge goes against the fence. You adjust the fence so that the, the cut goes wherever you want it across the width. And in this case, it's in the middle. Uh, and on this particular piece, if you notice, it's stopped on it's, it's stopped out on the front end and it can come out on this end. That means I have to I have to drop it onto the bit out there, and then I run it all the way through and it comes out the back. So I just need to put a mark on my fence to line up the front edge of the side piece. So I drop it down in the right place and then it comes out. The other piece, the stop is going to be on the opposite end because we're still putting the top against the fence. So in this case, the open end is going first. So I'm pushing it through and I have to have a mark on this side of the bit. So I stop pushing it and it's in the right place up here. Everybody good with that? And it's the same exact scenario for the slot for the, the drawer bottom. It stops actually right inside the finger, if you can see that. It actually stops, comes part way into the finger, but you just don't want it to run all the way through because then it would show as a little divot on the end of the, the finger. All right. Um, while, while we're on that drawer, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this fitting the drawer runners. We're clearly not gonna get all the way through all of this, so. Fire questions if you got them while I'm doing this. Too fast, too much? You already know it? George got a question for you. Yeah. Back on, on the uh, review that you were doing, uh, you said, did you like to cut um, your pieces to their final width uh, to minimize the loss when doing uh, jointing? But then after the joining, you go over and you take the same piece of wood over to the planer. So how do you deal? Well, 
Wait, I'm sorry, Richard, back, back up. Which pieces are we talking about again? Okay, the we're talking about, you're talking about the legs. They're talking the legs. About, yeah, we're talking about the legs that you cut those to the, to the uh, or just your standard practice is cut your wood to a minimum, to a final length. Final length, your, final length and final thickness. To deal with, uh, with uh, curvature of the wood. To, in other words, to reduce the amount of wood you have to remove when jointing. Right. Well, I, I don't. I don't cut them to final length. Don't cut them to final length yet. When you're when you're still joining and, and planing, you you need to leave extra on there. Okay, because of, because of the snipe, I presume. Well, it, yeah, that and and you you never know. Sometimes when you when you after you've jointed or planed away an eighth of an inch of thickness, a a crack appears. There, there's there's a stress fracture. There's a split that, that you couldn't see from uh, from the face. But now that you've taken away some of the material, or maybe there's a knot that didn't appear up at the surface, and now it might be showing. So um, okay. yeah, you need no, to get it down. Good. But yes, you, you you need to get you need to get to uh, over in length. Uh, length only gets length only gets locked in when it comes time to do the joinery. Thickness and, and width are kind of that right there at this, about that same time. But in terms of taking twist and warp and, and, and uh, uh, misshapen wood down, uh, leave extra length on there until, oh. until you've got it squared up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the way I do these drawer runners. And you'll see um okay i'm not gonna you can kind of see how it's oriented there there's there's a there's a trim piece up here on the top that goes all the way around on the sides front and back it's all at the same level so i've got a reference point that's consistent all the way around here so what I need to do is determine again, okay, so my drawer is upside down here yeah, because the table is upside down. So what I'm doing is I'll measure from the edge of the dado to the top of the drawer. Add 1 16th of an inch to that. And I'm doing that because I, the plan for all of this is that I have a 1 16th inch reveal all the way around the drawer front. Okay. So I want to, I want to get the, the number I want is the width from the top of the slot for the runner to here plus 1 16th of an inch. I'll rip a piece to that dimension. I can then take it in here set it in against that reference trim piece up there. I don't know if you can see that, but that, that and then I set the, whoops, trying to go too fast. You see where that's sitting in there? I set the runner then right on top of that trim piece and screw it into the back of the apron. And that sets, again, it, it drops down the width it takes to get to the drawer slot, the slot in the uh, side, and a 16th inch more, so there's a, a 16th of an inch reveal above the drawer. And then those get screwed into place. Does that make sense? You could do it, you could do it referencing from the bottom but we don't have a consistent, we don't have a nice, easy, flat level piece to reference off of. It's a lot to digest, it's awfully quiet. This, this actually, this has to do in some, to some extent with the design of this particular piece and the, and the fact that it has this trim strip on top. It's one of those where, you know, you could attach, you say that's, that's there to attach the top. Well, yeah, it is. Uh, and there are a lot of other ways you could attach the top that would not involve that extra trim piece. 
But at the same time, it gives us that consistent reference point all the way around and, and specifically on the left and the right side where the Brewer runners need to go. It gives us the perfect reference point to be able to suspend the drawer from a fixed location and have it come out spot on in the center of the opening. George, I've got a question then. Okay. In terms of order of things, and do you do that once the once you've kind of got it built to this point? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's okay. right. That's what I said. I maybe maybe I, said. I I jumped ahead to to cover the drawer thing. Got it. Um, we haven't done any any glue up or any of that yet. Where, where in reality, I don't start building the drawer until this gets glued up. Okay. I mean, I've rough milled the thickness. Yeah. But the but, drawer but comes I'll later. have this glued up before I start doing the, the, the finger jointing and, and gluing up the drawer. Uh, and then I've got then I've got this in, in place. Yeah. Okay. Well then let me ask you this. The 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 four pieces that you know your trim to go all the way yeah. around, yeah. that's not mortised in, is it? How'd you how do you secure that? Um those guys are they're screwed to here. Uh, here's what you see from the front. So there's the rail at the bottom with the cloud lift in it. Uh -huh. And then the offset trim piece at the top that's sitting on there, glued and screwed on. Oh, okay. Okay, so it gives us, it, it completes, and actually this doesn't have it on there. There's another little, like a popsicle stick, I call it, trim piece that gets put on the ends here with a little radius on it that basically completes the frame and panel appearance. Got it. When in reality, there's no frame and panel, it's all glued up solid. This is a quarter inch thick piece that's glued onto the face of the apron. The little popsicle stick gets glued on the face here. It's only three inches long. So it's, it's glue will not, that glue joint will not break loose. This piece is set on glue and, and screwed on the top. And it gives you that, the green and green standard scenario is everything has a transition from one plane to the next. It's all rounded over. And everything is stepped, ah. and that gives us a step. This could, and we're, this is where a lot of people have, have done the class and said, "Well, why don't you do? Why don't you do the same thing up there as you did down here? Just glue a piece on up there. Yeah, make the apron half an inch taller, and glue a trim piece on. And you could do that, and you could then still use Z clips into a little slot here to attach the top to the base." But you'd lose this flat reference surface that I'm using to put my little spacer strip in here to give me a spot on location very easily to put that drawer on. Got it. Okay. I, for some reason, I thought those were hidden within inside the case of the of no. the end table, but they're not. They you, no. Yeah. Okay. No, no. There's Got there's it. one other one other element of it that uh, let me show you. There's actually. There's actually a little rabbit. Yeah. Right, right here. It's about a 16th of an inch step, uh, 16th of an inch deep and half an inch in. Um, that's, and that's to give room for a Z clip that oh. comes over, notches down, and then has a plate. So you, you overlap that onto here and, there's a, and you put a screw up into the bottom of the top. That secures the top to this strip. And since it's a Z clip, it's only attached to the top. It, and then it's, it, can, it can slide on here, either in and out or lengthwise as the top expands and contracts. Got it. Okay. And the fact that there's a notch, I mean, you could say, well, why don't you just make this, this whole strip a little bit thinner and then, and then the Z clip could just sit right on, the, on top of it. Well. If you do that, then the runner of the drawer or the top edge of the drawer will hit that clip. Oh. Don't ask me how I know that. 
<laughs> <laughs> one time you you think you've got a, a, a better mousetrap um and you know there's there's a reason yeah okay okay and just just as a quick one i guess just i'm sitting here staring at it you'll notice i i make my mortises a little bit longer than my, what my tenons are and i do that on purpose one for one reason is that that allows a, little, a, a place for excess glue to instead of squeezing out and making a mess to have to clean up raising the grain all all the potential issues you have with that that provides a pocket on top and bottom if i get too much glue it'll go there first and be less likely to come squeezing out and uh, uh, get on the face and cause me a problem it also allows me to uh, adjust the fit perfectly so i can get things flush you know the leg flush with the top and same thing with the stretcher rails. I haven't gotten to that yet, and we're we're at, at twenty to nine. You want me to go there, or how, how we how we feeling? I think we're good to continue a little bit. Okay. All right. Let me let me set these guys aside real quick. I think what I'll do is I'll just. Uh, If we can, George, let's ride it right out till nine, and uh, okay. that okay. way uh, we, you know we're used to going till nine, and then we'll we'll cut it off. Okay. I I'll I'll keep going until you shut me off. <laughs> okay. So what I do with 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 a glue up is I'll glue up the left side, and I glue up the right side, then all the clamps are off, and now I'm just putting in the back and the front. That's pretty pretty standard process. Um, what has to happen here is this, this apron needs to be flush with the tops of these uh, legs. And also the stretcher down at the bottom needs to be parallel with the floor. So it needs to be the same height from the bottom of the leg to the bottom of the stretcher it needs to be identical. Um, and, and especially if there's gonna be a shelf that's suspended, here, if, if any, if either any of those stretchers is sitting like this, and God forbid, one's like that and one's like that, it's, it's going to look horrible. So it's critical to get them dead horizontal. So um, that essentially is the same problem uh, with the top and with the bottom. And I'll show you, I'll show you two different ways of, of, of dealing with it. The, the simple one for the bottoms is cut a spacer that is the, that puts. You know, it puts the, the, the foot and the bottom of the stretcher at the right leg. Make it, it can be, you just make four. Tape it to the leg, tape one to the other leg. Since I have my mortises a little longer than my tenon stop, I put, when I set this in, when I put glue in the mortises and I put this, this uh, stretcher in, I put it in so it's high in the mortise. And so I know I need to adjust it down. Okay, so if I do that, when I get this, I, I just need to, like I did here, I'm just, this, this isn't tightly clamped, it's just snug. So I can get to this point, set it down on the bench top, take a dead blow hammer and tap that in, tap that in, and they're exactly dead par parallel. Do the same thing on the other side. And then when I put the two together, you do the same thing. Use those same spacers. And it'll always, you don't, it, I've, I, you know, people put a pencil mark on there and then they tap and tap and tap to line it up with a pencil mark on the leg. And I'm sorry, but the way I go is I tap, tap, it's just a little more. Well, that next tap goes too far. And now you're tapping back the other way and, and you're coming up, from, there's not enough room and you're starting to rack things. The less messing around, once you've got glue in those joints, the better. Because the more you're sliding stuff around there, uh, it just doesn't grab as tight again. So that's the quick quick way that I find for, for setting those, those bottom rails. You essentially have to do the same thing here and you could just do the same thing, sort of clamp it, put it upside down. And if you tap on the ends of the legs and tap on the bottom of the apron, that should put you dead, dead flush there. And that'll do the job most of the time, but, um, I, I find what is more foolproof 
and again, less disruptive with the tap, tap, tap all, all over the place is again, I'll, I'll set, I'll, I'll set the aprons so they're down in the bottom of the mortars. So the apron is lower than the top of the leg. So I need to move the apron up. So what I'll do is, is get it to that point. Just take that one of my clamping calls, something good and rigid and stiff that's, that's flat. I put that across, across the tops of the legs. I can then take a clamp and I can just dial that clamp in and it, it just slides that apron up until, until it's just snug flush. Take another one there and it just, it, they're just dead snug flush right at the top of there. No fuss, no fuss. You're not tapping and jarring and tapping and jarring. And when you tap, that's when the clamps fall off and they ding the corners of the legs. Uh, again, don't ask me how I know that one, but um, this, is, this is just smooth and it's easy. Uh, it's extremely accurate, very reliable. Um, and okay, so, so both sides will go together that way. Uh, let me give you the quick, Okay, to do uh, well, let's see, do it this way. So this is this is the drawer section going in here, going towards towards you. This is the front. This is the left. This is the left side. So my drawer is going to go that way. So what I've done is the drawer front. What I need to what I need to position now is this this drawer rail that goes underneath goes below the drawer. So there's the drawer rail. There's a sixteenth inch gap. There's the drawer, and a sixteenth inch gap, and then that top trim piece. So what I did is I cut a, a spacer piece that has the space for the top trim, which is half an inch. I they don't have it on there yet, so I have that that allows for the trim piece that's going to go on there. The 16th inch reveal on top, 16th reveal on the bottom, and the drawer front is three inches. So this spacer is three and five eighths wide. So now all I have to do is clamp that in there. So again, I'll, 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 I'll position, I'll position, this piece at the bottom of the mortise, get them put into place, put the call across the top, use the clamp on one end and on the other, and it'll pull it right up there snug. When I pull this piece out, take my three inch drawer, it'll have a perfect 16th inch reveal below and on top. And, and this rail will be parallel with the top rail and parallel with both edges on the, on the drawer. You see that happening? It's a lot, it's a lot. Um, try and do this one quick. Shaping, shaping the, uh, shape that edge. You got the cloud lift on the bottom of the apron here. You could, you could make a one template out of half inch, three eighths inch, whatever you, you've got around. Make a template that has that pattern for it and use double-sided tape and position that on your workpiece. Okay. Uh, Okay, so see the templates on the bottom or it's on the top, whatever, whichever. Okay, so then you use a, a pattern bit in your in your table, uh, router table. And thing is this router bit is gonna go counterclockwise. So in this direction, the bearing is riding on the template up on top and it's cutting downhill. So you're all good there, everything's happy. 
when you get out to this end, your cutter is still going counterclockwise, which means it's going this way. So as it makes contact back in here, it's, it's, there's a high likelihood of popping that piece off because the, the cutters are coming in from behind and these, these, these fibers are not supported. So that's, that's a risk, a pretty good risk. So um, one way around that, and this is my go-to bit for patterning. Um, it's got a bearing on top and on bottom. And you can see that the cutter itself is, is at a sheer angle. It's not spiral, but it's not straight. It's at an angle. So it does slice, not chop, like a straight cutter would. So what I can do, because this has a, both a top and a bottom bearing, I can use the, put the, have the pattern up and go downhill here and be safe, go to the midway point. Now I can flip it the other way. And so the pattern is not on the bottom. I just raise my bit up in the router table so that the bottom bearing, or top bearing, sorry, is now on the template. And now again, I'm going downhill, safe, where they meet in the middle. You might have just a slight little sanding to do to, to, to blend them together, but you've made a safe cut on two downhill uh, uh, copes. If I had, if I, a spiral cutter will give a cleaner cut, but bearings only on, on the bottom. You cannot get one of these with a bearing up top here. So you'd be fine when you have the template on top because you're going downhill on here, but you can't flip it to do the other one because the bearing is still up. Okay, so that's an inexpensive way to do it. You get that style bit and you just do a, the two-sided tape and you just have to keep moving that template as you do each part. You could, and you can use that same template on this piece because it is the same cloud lip. So you're just sticking it onto the front of that. So you can do the aprons and you can do that, that door uh, rail. Again, and again, if you're if you're doing a, a pair of these for your house and that's all you're going to do, that'll get you there. Um, if you're going to do more, uh, then a jig is going to do a better job. And this is in this scenario, then the the template is the edge here, and the, the way this is built, this side is where you put the wide apron. And this side is where you cut the narrow drawer rail. And the way you address these then is you just put the piece on. And here we're gonna always use the shear bit. And we have it up so that the, the bearing up towards the router is against the template on the bottom. So we'll run that downhill to the midway point, take the clamps off, flip the piece over, clamp it back in, and right back down to, to the middle. You don't have to take the template off, you just unclamp it, flip it over, and you can safely do a downhill cut on both ends. Or you get to get somebody else to build one, and, and to get combined, you build one of these. Or, you call me and you can borrow it. Um, George, is there a downside to uh, often, and I'm probably doing this wrong, but often in that scenario, I will uh, route to a certain position and then I just come back and go the opposite way and make a climb cut. Is that asking for trouble? Uh, you, you still have that potential. You still have that tear out potential. You, okay. If as long as you have a, as long as it's a spiral cutter, you've you've reduced it, um, and you know you might get away with it quite a few times. Okay. Um, uh, but the one time it blows on you, 
uh, hopefully it, it's only the piece of wood blows and it doesn't, you know, cause, cause damage. I mean, the piece will be shot, but um, sometimes, sometimes when, when a, a, a router bit that's spinning 12,000 RPMs or something catches on wood, um, it'll, it'll grab this guy out of your hands. And if that bit ever comes in contact with any of the metal, you got another potential. Yeah. And and when a uh, it's it's just better not to. I, I I'll I'll admit I have done it that way. Uh, and I've gotten away with it so far. I I since since modifying these uh, the process now and actually the way I build these jigs now, I don't even put the pattern on both ends. I don't even I don't I'll have the cloud lift here only. I don't even make this, this end of it. I just let that be free. So I, I can only I can only route it in this direction. I have to stop and either do the raise the bit or the bit up and, and do it the other way or flip the piece. It just guarantees me safety. Got it. So well, you, you got about five minutes left. Would it make sense to open it up for questions? And sure. Sure. Yeah. I think I think the only other the only other thing I was I was gonna get into the the only other two other things are the, the breadboard ends and those uh, the indent detail on the bottoms of the leg. So I'll I'll go wherever you want to go. If there are questions, let's let's take them. Yeah, it might make more sense because I, I think the idea of a follow-up BST to hit some of those might be really good because I need yeah. to go through that in four minutes, you know. Yeah, yeah. Those and, and I can also do the ebony spline shaping and, and button making and okay. in a bit. Okay. There's so, one question from Darren Blanchard on the, the brand of pattern bit you use. Do you mind? This uh, this guy is a mana. Uh, knew that would be a question. It's an Amana 47097. And the white side spiral bits. Uh, one is a long one. The first one there, the 5200, is a long one and, it'll, and it has a, about a two inch cutting length, which is the same as what the Amana does. Um, for a little less money, you can get the other other white side and it's uh, an inch and a quarter cutting length, I believe it is. For my money, that Amana bit uh, is, is sweet. For, for, for uh, cloud lift type shaping like this, um, I still, where I don't have to flip a pattern, I'll use this, the white side spiral cutter because it just is a, a cleaner cut, uh, less grab. Okay. I, I've never had a problem with the amount of though either. You ever use a white side ultimate? Uh, I have. The, the, the downside for me with that is it's a short cutting length. Yeah, about an inch and an eighth. It, it, also, it also is a larger diameter. So, so the, the radius down here on this cloud lift, um, the bearing won't follow it in close enough. So you'll end up with a, a more gradual slope Got radius because the diameter of the bit makes a difference how, how tight a radius you can get into. And, and those are great bits, uh, okay. but that's, that's, that's the limitation I've seen. And, and especially if you're gonna do, do anything like on, on uh, legs, uh, Chair legs, never you know, like this right here. Oh yeah, of course. See, that's an inch and a half thick. Uh, yeah. So you can't do it with that bit. You need yeah. you need a two inch cutter in order to, to do that step. An inch and a half is, is a pretty common size for things like an end table, nightstand, coffee table, sofa table. Sometimes you'll go, go more than an inch and five eighths, but uh, that two inch cutting length is, is well worth it. Uh, and the amount, of, quite honestly, the amount is cheaper. I want to say this, it's like 80 bucks, 84 bucks. And I think the long white side is more like 96 bucks. Good. Just for reference. Uh, Jerry Couchman's got a question here about the, the wood that you use for the drawer glides. Um, I usually use either maple or white uh, oak. I always, um, and I always use quarter sawn. And, and if you look at, if, it, if this is the drawer runner, 
you see there's a, there's a slight radius here on these two edges, which means uh, this, this edge goes against the inside of the case. And you can see the screw countersinks. Yeah. So I want quarter sawn uh, material um, with the grain running that way. And the reason I, I prefer it to be that way is, is this wood is gonna expand along in the direction of the growth rings. So it, it, it will expand and contract in this dimension. It's not going to very minimally this way. So what's important to me is in this way, it's trapped in that dado. And if it swells, it's gonna, it's gonna stick there. And for me to get in to adjust this, to take a little bit off of this, to get it to run smooth again, is more problematic than if I have it oriented this way and it's, let's say it expands and gets, gets wider this way. Okay, it'll get tight in the drawer there as well. I mean, you've, you've left a little extra space here, but if it gets tight enough to drag on the drawer, it's pretty easy for me to reach in with a, a block with some sandpaper on it and take a, a few whiskers off that inside face or take a, a low angle block plane and take a little shave off of that. And then the, the, that drawer will fit back in, that, in the runner. Adjusting in this dimension is difficult. This way it's easy. So I will always go this way with, with the Corson grain going that way. And again, it, it's a, a hard wood. I never finish the wood, I'll wax it only. But a good hard maple or a, a Corson white oak. Um, and and I, it goes on after the finish has been put on the piece. And I only, I only put wax on it. I use Ren, Renaissance wax, um, but whatever, whatever base wax you use. Um, Put it on the inside of the dado and put it on the runner. It works slick. Is there is there something from a woodworking standpoint um, in high end nightstands, things like that, where you don't use drawer glides? You know, purchased drawer glides, or what's the thought process on that? There's 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 a there's always going to be a debate on that, and, and I I I'm I'm one that is is constantly torn with it. These are this is a Daryl Peart design, and he has always done it only with, with wood runners. All of his case pieces have wood runners, except uh, the, the big pedestal desk, and, that, and in that case, the bottom drawer, which, is, which is, has uh, hanging files um, and a buttload of weight, because this is, this is holding file folders and a lot of paper, um, and access to the back is important. So there, there we use... Um, uh, AccuRide full extension drawer glides. The issue you run into with with going to metal glides is where do you mount where do you mount the, the hardware, the glide itself, and keep the drawer front looking like like this drawer front. Yeah, that's true. You don't have a face really. Yeah. Yeah. You 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 uh, uh, metal drawer glides with an applied drawer front give you the room to to say let the drawer front hang out an extra half an inch and the drawer runner will go behind that. Yeah. So you see it from the front. So, but if you, if you want this kind of a, of a wooden joinery that's exposed at the front drawer front, you have to then, uh, the only other option that I've been able to come up with is you need to bury the drawer glide in the thickness of the sides. Got it. So, so you need a half inch, depth dado into the side which makes any and then you need to have enough depth beyond that for the screws to hold it so you kind of have to you pretty much have to have an inch thick side and on a drawer this high you, you pull that out and it's twice as thick as this it looks really clunky but what what we've done on what we do on the on the pedestal desk is, is we make it an inch thick and we do route that half inch dado in it. But on the upper portion of this, we've taken a rabbit, so there's a step. So it's, it's half inch wide at the top, down about an inch and a half, it, it, it steps back out to one inch thickness. Oh. Because down there is where the drawer glide goes in. The upside to that particular application is that's a, floor, a, a drawer that's going to hold hanging files. Yeah, so hanging the thing files, fits in. Hanging files need a little metal rail 
to hang from. So that little, that rabbit, that shelf is the place where we put the notch to put the, the metal hanger rod so it doesn't look bad. Got it. If, if this was going to be a clothing storage drawer, you don't, you're not going to have that. So at first glance, you would see the narrower side on the top, but you'd see the step down, down below. Is that objectionable to you? The upside is by using full extension drawer blades, you can actually pull this all the way out and get the stuff all the way in the back. With wooden runners, you're always, there's always a part of it has to stay engaged. So you can't get all the way to the back. So six one half doesn't the other. Yeah. A lot of times, more often than not, what we end up doing is we put the drawer back forward a little bit. So, so as you pull it out, you'll see the back of the drawer and you'll stop pulling in theory. And that way you, you don't pull it all the way out and it drops on the floor and break yeah. those big piece. So <laughs> there, there are gives and takes with those. I mean, uh, another scenario is using the, the Blum undermount uh, style of glass. And, yeah. and you can do that. You can do that with this stock. I've, I've, got, I've got some drawer box parts in, uh, down here that I was going to use for my kitchen and rent and I haven't done. Uh, but I was going to use it for the shop. What you end up having to do then is you have to extend this is face down to provide room for the glide to be down there and be hidden. But the fact that the runner is down here means it doesn't interfere with any of this. If it's on the side, it does interfere with that. So we can, we can raise the bottom. We put the drawer bottom up higher, leaving more of a, a deeper gap at the bottom behind the drawer front to hide the, the, the blum undermount runners but but uh, it, it's again you have to sacrifice uh three quarters of an inch five eighths to three quarters of an inch on the bottom of every drawer yeah yeah well, maybe not a big deal but uh all depends on how, what you use the drawers for okay a lot of a lot of factors to yeah. weigh out there's no one easy answer it's just uh what are your priorities and um for me, efficiency and, and use of the space is, is a big thing. So I, I, I lean more towards wanting to see a, a better mousetrap for using metal runners to, for full extension without having to give up too much space. Because leaving the back of the drawer buried in the case or having it fall down on the floor all the time uh, is, is less desirable to me. Sure. <laughs> it's just my, my personal opinion on it. But yeah. People are paying their own $5,000 for that. Fremont nightstand with three drawers in it, and uh, they—they're even shorter than this. They're—they're, they're, I think, uh, three inches shorter in depth. Oh, okay. So those really don't come out very far. Well, we're we're kind of out of time. Is there any other questions that anybody would like to throw in there before we sign off for tonight? Speak now or forever hold your peace. I know it's a lot to process. Yep. Well, I would say, I want to say thank you, George. A lot of informative, great tips. I, I have to ask you this. Do you have some kind of hidden camera in my shop or something where you're recording all my mistakes? Because every one of these things you've referenced, <laughs> <laughs> I have done. Uh, and no, no. So. <laughs> I've, I've lived them all, believe me, and many, many more. That's, that's, that's one of the I guess that's one of the side benefits of, of building a lot. You make a lot of mistakes, yeah. but you look. Guess it's a numbers game. Huh? Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, doing a follow-up BST that not only covers uh, those breadboard ends like you talked about, the ebony yeah. plugs, the ebony splines that you've got. Plus, I'd like yeah. to see how that handle is created, your drawer handle. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know? Well, well, this, this yeah, one or the, yeah. 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 There's that's plenty. A, not, not a rocket science one there either. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I can do that. I mean, that, that's, that's something that, uh, you know, I've helped Daryl teach classes. His, he's always had his details one and details two. The, and our, they're like a two day uh, weekend workshop. And, and uh, uh, you go through half a dozen different green, green details. Um, you don't build a piece of furniture, but you build mock-ups that you can take back to the shop and use as, yeah. as reference. Yeah. Um, 
and, and all of those things and, and quite a few more are, are things I, I mean, I've taught those classes too. So um, I, I, I see those being relatively easy to put into a VST situation. That's great because those I, techniques can be used in any project. Yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, I, I'd, I'd be curious to hear from people over the next month or two um, if there's interest in, in building this nightstand or another green green style nightstand or coffee table or something um, as, as like, I'm thinking, I'm thinking maybe what would work more flexibly for people who are both retired and still working uh, is to maybe do a two or three weekends kind of back to back and, and you, you learn the processes and do part of it in the class weekend and then you take your parts home and finish out the other two pieces or whatever it is. Uh, come back and get the next little tidbits to work on and go home and then, and then you end up after five or six days you've got the finished piece. Yeah. Uh, if you're interested in doing that and, and if, if there is in, in what piece and I'll, I'll work with Greg on uh, doing something like that. And because I, I, I've done this class where we did this, used all of these exact processes and, and I have four, well, we had eight people. No, it was four people uh, at a woodcraft, woodcraft classes where, where four people in five days built a pair of these each. Oh, okay. All right. So, so it's doable. Now that's with me pre-milling to rough dimensions. Um, and then you, and then the students doing all of the ripping to ripping to width, cutting to length, doing all the joinery, all the shaping, all the, all the, the glue ups, the, the ebony, the, all the rest of that. Um, and we, and we finished, well, we, our, we got done to the point of applying finish. Okay. So well, I would uh, like to speak on behalf of the class that yes, we'd like to do that. So okay. <laughs> okay. I hope you, you and Greg can get together. I think that would be great. Okay. I will sign okay. up. <laughs> we'll, in, closing, we'll in closing, I do want to answer Don Erickson's question, which is, will this recording be available on YouTube? And yes, Don, that's the, uh, the hope here. I have to admit the last two presentations, Daryl's and, um, oh, who was last week? Um, I mean, last month, ah, well, I forget, but those I did record but Zoom gives me the ability to record to my computer or to record to the cloud. Those last two I recorded to the cloud and I can't find them. But I believe when I record to the computer, it's easier for me to access and then put it on YouTube. So that's what I did tonight. Keeping my fingers crossed, I'll be able to put this on YouTube and I will do that in the next day or two, so. Excellent. All righty. Good. Well, George, we owe you a round of applause and appreciate you stepping in this month and, and uh, it was very informative. That's all good. If anybody, if anybody has questions that come up, uh, you feel free to send me an email or text or give me a call. Um, I'll, as, soon as, as soon as I hear that Al is back, uh, I'll have him uh, send out that, that uh, document that I have prepped up. It's, right. got, it's, got, it's got more of the details that I, I had to kind of skip over to. Sure, yeah, but just to even have the notes printed. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, cool. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you very much. And everybody, have a great post Labor Day week. And we will see y'all soon. See y'all next time. Thanks again, George. Yep. Bye.